Joining us now on Amazing But True, Jake Brown, Nelson Figueroa is a former Mets infielder, played in the outfield at one point. He played seven seasons for the Mets from 2008 to 2015, an all-star in 2014, the NLCS MVP in 2015, where he just kept hitting homers and just would not stop hitting home runs, helping the Mets get to the World Series. His final year in the big leagues came in 2020, but he might not be done yet as he will play for the Long Island Ducks beginning in just a few weeks on April 28th. Let's give a warm, amazing, but true welcome to number 28 on the scorecard, but number one in our hearts, one of my all-time favorite Mets, Beef Jerky, as I called him, Danny Murphy, was the name of my fantasy team name, but you are Daniel Murphy. Welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on. Cheers, Jake. That's that's quite the open right there. I've been watching the All In podcast, so like, there's a bit of pressure on the on the bit of the the host. To, I'm I'm humbled. Thank you for having me, and I appreciate you uh, sharing some of my accolades that I got to share uh, with the uh, the great teammates I had in New York, like you, Figgy, and uh, the fans as well. How you doing, brother? I'm um, well, brother. Good to talk to you. Finally, we've been dying to get a chance to talk to Daniel Murphy. And it wasn't that there wasn't a reason to, but man, when uh, I heard that you were making the comeback, I was going to be more excited as a guy who played till he was 40 years old. I knew I had something left in the tank, something left to prove, uh, you know, and I think that uh, I'm really excited to see you in a couple of days, uh, get a chance to see exactly all the things you've been working on and uh, see where that swing is these days. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Um yeah, I kind of set out on this adventure um, and I had really, I won't say no intentions of ever playing, you know what I mean? Probably seven or eight months ago, but very little. That wasn't the kind of the, the curiosity that drew me. Um, but yeah, I've been, I've been moving and I like the way it feels. And I started looking for a sandlot to play in and Long Island was gracious enough to let me use theirs. And you talked in an interview recently that, you know, it was your nine-year-old and playing, I guess, with him that kind of got you maybe motivated to play again. Was that the motivation was playing around, seeing the kids have fun and like, you know what, I could have fun again, too, at 38 years old. Yeah, I think that was definitely some of it. I kind of there's something to the movie, you know, Sandlot. I think those those kids had it sorted. Um, look at my shirt. Sandlot. Well, oh, look yeah. at you flying. Yes. Yeah. Look at that. I didn't even know. Yeah, I see him. A porter right yeah. there. And so, yeah, I think just the. Not that I didn't enjoy it, but there's a carefreeness that children have um, when you don't have as much experience from life. And, you know, it's just it was great fun to just see the joy they got. And then it probably as well really helped me to kind of more intently focus on um, the pitcher batter matchup, because it seems to me that the cool thing about baseball, it's such a cool game. I didn't know how cool our game was. I've been watching like Ken Burns's documentary and I had very little idea just how cool our game is, but it's, I don't know, like proper Americans. We have a heavyweight bout the pitcher goes first, the hitter gets to, you know, he, he gets to make the last decision and then all hell breaks loose. You know what I mean? <laughs> and it's, um, yeah, it's a cool game. And so I got to kind of add that into the adventure as well, too. Um, just going through Ken Burns's documentary really was very enlightening. Biggie, a few years away from the game, he's talking philosophically over here. It's like a philosopher Murphy at our Dr. Murphy here. Well, I heard there was, a, I, and I, I hate that I, I forget her name, but there's a woman on in the documentary, and she's a Brooklyn Dodgers fan. And but she she talks about that right before they start talking about Walter Johnson. She goes, "This, she goes, I love, I love this duel, this matchup. You know what I mean? Of where the pitcher knows about the batter because you've done it before, and the batter knows about the pitcher, and it's." As, as far as I can tell, it's a fight over the wickets. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like we're fighting over the wickets, seven by 10. Um, yep. And so you go, she goes, when she would say, what, when people don't, they ask me, how do you, how do you do this baseball? It's just nine people out there standing. She goes, but this, in this moment, there's two movements, bang, bang. Yep. And then we go. Yep. Very much like a duel. You got to take aim and fire and you got to figure out exactly where I'm going, how I'm getting there and be able to counteract that. And that's the beauty of that matchup. I always talk to people about that seven by 10 that you mentioned what that means, Jake, because Jake, it went right by over his head. Seven by 10 is the strike zone, seven balls wide by 10 balls high. Um, I simplify that for my pitchers that I train to tell them there's a lot of room in the strike zone and you don't have to be perfect. Just try to avoid the, probably the 20 balls in the middle of the strike zone and you'll be all right. You know, and so I think for a hitter, 
And someone like you, man, without having the shift now, not that the shift hindered you in any way, because I mean, that was your bread and butter. Please shift Daniel Murphy, see what happens. You know, he's able to, he understands his swing. He understands, you know, what, what a pitcher can do and can't do. And he takes advantage of that. I mean, we're watching you hit screamers down the left field line all day long. If they're going to move over, okay, now I'll pull the ball. And that's one of the great things about a guy with a swing like yours. I'm really curious to find out. You talked about you had time away from the game. You watched, you know, all these inspirational things. But the the essence of the swing, what has changed that you think you may have figured out a little bit more well, that's going to help you? Yeah. And I appreciate it. And I would say it's more something that I would, I've observed, you know what I mean? This isn't anything I think that I've by any stretch of the imaginations would pretend to say have solved or anything, just something I've observed. And I've basically tried this out on myself. I've mm -hmm. kind of treated my, I have a buddy of mine and he said it, he goes, um, basically, uh, like a startup company okay. and I'm using myself to test, you know, this observation that I feel like I've made. So I would say I would start off maybe, if I can get down to first principles ish. Um, if you believe that the swing is a turn in a rotation in mm -hmm. some capacity from just barely above any turn, you know what I mean? To um, a figure skater going for the gold. You know what I mean? Yep. Like yep. just a rotation. I don't stop rotating or turning until I redirect to run the bases or head back to the dugout. You know what I mean? If mm -hmm. I didn't defend the wickets properly. Mm -hmm. So I would say that, the swing that that I honed and um, am very proud of um, wasn't as concerned with rotating. If mm -hmm. That makes sense. That wasn't my. It wasn't one of the main priorities. You know right. what I mean? Right, right. It was. Um, and so, what I would say I end up honing is what I would refer to from a ball flight standpoint. If you're familiar with golf, mm -hmm. is a is a right to left faded ball flight. That's Got the it. ball flight I honed, if that if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Inside inside out, trying to Yeah, know. it's like well, like, you know, stay on the ball, yep. you know, stay through the middle of the field and um, you know, stay inside the ball. And so I honed a, a fade approach, right to Got left. It. Yep. Um and tried to prevent myself from hooking balls low and on the to the pool side. You mm -hmm. know, especially once they start shifting because well, they're standing right there. Yeah. Um doesn't seem to be the case anymore. So I would say with that, now if the if we believe the swing is, is a turn in some capacity, I'm going full, full turn. Like I'm, I don't want to stop turning and rotating and accelerating my rotation on the turn until I redirect to either, um, you know, ask somebody if that was a strike on a punch out um, or to, well, to start that all hell breaking loose and hopefully get around the bases. So that, that would, I would okay. say kind of, you know, is a place to start. You know what I mean? I'm going, I'm trying to turn. I love Jake's face right now because when I break things down for Jake, he kind of gets that glance over his eyes. Like, uh, I'm not really sure there was a couple of extra syllables in there. Well, you start I mean, saying kinetic chain and torque. I'm like, I, I was terrible <laughs> in science class. That was not, that was not okay. one of my favorite uh, subjects. So Figgy throws out some big words, even though my mom did teach SAT tutors. Um, you know, there's still a lot of words that are too many syllables, too big for me. Um, <laughs> Did the new rules, Murph, you know, the the banning of the shift and everything going on, did that have any influence on you coming back and trying to make a run at this? No. Nothing. No. Okay. I'll try to – I mean, I would say it this way. Like, my son loves extended after school because mm -hmm. he gets to free play out there. He just, you know, he gets observed enough that there are adults there that they don't kill each other, but he gets to free play. That's probably one of the best explanations I could give for this adventure. It's been free play and it's, it's made me not made me. It's, I think I've always been curious about the swing. I mean, I, I chose this as a profession. We all saw how I defended. So we know I wasn't spending more time <laughs> defending than I was swinging a bat. So I've been very, very curious about the swing for probably since I was five years old and realized that if you hit this, this stone on the barrel with this stick, adults, are like it. And they seem to really want to play with you. I was like, <laughs> You've got me. I can do that. Um, and so I, as I was kind of after being away from the game for two years in a unique way, I would say my my passion for the curiosity of the swing was aroused. And then all these experiences started coming back to me, like experiences where like I've been eaten. You know what I mean? You've got to get shoveled off because like, well, you don't know what you don't know. And sometimes it's people like Figgy who are, you know, they just have to teach you things like, oh, hmm. 
you uh, you want to be aggressive with a runner in scoring position. Here's a breaking ball in the grass. Why don't you there take you that one? It's like, nope, mm-hmm. I will not take that. I will swing at that. <laughs> um, and so I just had all these. And then, you know, these, some of the successes of like, man, it seems like when I moved like that, it's very similar to how I'm trying to move now. But I, I had more difficulty putting my fingers on it, you know, right. tangibly. You know what I mean? And so, you know, does it doesn't mean I'm right, obviously, by any stretch of the imagination, but it seems to have, it's been great fun for me. Um, and I've tested it out as best I know, kind of like moving mm-hmm. um, the same way I would um, to get ready for a season, but it was more play, not an anticipation of, of going to play. Now that, that, that freedom that you speak of, you know, that that's a wonderful thing. Cause as you know, with my career, it was every outing was the most important thing. It was life or death for me because if I had a bad outing, I was probably going back down to the minor leagues. It was, that was kind of that sensation of the pressure of, man, I have to perform and I have to do not just adequately, but I have to do well enough to get another opportunity. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, throughout your career, I remember, I remember the beginnings and this is a story. I don't know if you even remember Um, triple a, the only game in triple a that you had, um mm-hmm. well new orleans when you showed up mm-hmm. and, zephyrs uh, uh-huh yep uh murphy you were playing third base that night i, I played believe. third base that night uh-huh. right man you and have a really good memory that's really base. really impressive oh, oh, oh it's about to get way better too this is the, mm-hmm. the best part about this story so i remember it vividly you came up and we had heard about man this guy can rake this guy has a great, beautiful swing with you see um and you get there day one and he's oh for going into his last at bat Winds up getting his hit, his first hit in Triple A. You know, we're plotting everything, very cool. Um, Murphy comes in and immediately gets called into the office. Uh, he's going to the show. We're like, Jesus, he, he barely got here. So yeah. the best part was is that when you got the call about you were going to the show, they informed you that it was to play left field. Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's not the part. So I remember what was on your face. Do you remember what was on your face at the time? Probably a look of fear and trepidation, I would say. Uh, you had the worst mustache I had ever seen. You had Oh, this man, we were, were, oh, my goodness, we had done that in Binghamton. <laughs> yes. That's right. And the first thing you said was, yeah. do I keep it or do I shave it off? Yeah. I'm like, you're going to the show, bro. You got to get rid of that thing. It was Yeah, brutal. you did. That was good advice, too. That was really good <laughs> advice. Well, you don't want to, I mean... There's a place for the bingo. You know what I mean? Correct. Like, I love the bingo. Correct. I love Binghamton. But like the place for the bingo is not in the show. And I that was very sage advice. I appreciate that. Man, I forgot that. Well, so, I mean, getting called up to AAA for me was, well, not as significant, but you like, like you guys were pros. I had been playing with like, I would say like, not guys I came up with you know what right, I mean right, so when right. I got there it was it just had a very professional feel to it and I was like well I had just come from somewhere where we had decided to grow mustaches okay <laughs> and it was, you know, at that as 23 so all the all the kids in Binghamton had just grown fed up with the season and we were going rogue so um yeah, I remember being in AAA and thinking this is this is different like there's these guys seem like more mature hunters if that yeah. makes sense. Yes. Like I got, I got my, I got my knock that night and I hit it off the toe a bit and kind of got this like whoosh, base hit. You know what I mean? And I was like, these guys, cause I, I think I got a couple of breaking balls flipped in there and positive counts that I had earned. And I was like, why would you do that? I'm supposed to get fastballs. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, and so I just, I do remember thinking that and I was like, these are more mature killers around here. Yep. Yep. And that, and that was one of the things that I remember. And then you went up to, play left field, not having played left field before. And I uh, believe you made a web gem, did you not? I made a, I made a really nice play and unset the bar significantly too hot for how I ended <laughs> up performing in left field that season. And, and well, for about maybe four weeks the next season, they ran me out <laughs> there. But then it, it, was, it didn't last much longer than that. You talk about, you know, kind of coming back for the fun and swing and everything. What if you hit well? New York Mets need a DH. They need someone for the final few months as an injury. Uh, you know, I know this is more of a fun thing, but what if it works out? Like, have you thought about being back in the big leagues? Because, you you know, 2019, you had a, actually a really good year. 2020, I don't count because they were sticking nasal swabs up your nose every day, and it was only 60 games, So, and there was nobody in the crowd. So your last real season was a pretty good one. So I feel like you got something left in the tank. Well, I appreciate that. 
Um, the smart money has me getting shoveled off, um, you know, on one of these sandlot fields. But <laughs> now I would say that I've, I've set out again. It's when my, when my friend said kind of startup, it, it, it really resonated with me because that's how I've treated it. I've just been throwing, I'll have an idea and I'll grab a bat or a stone. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I'll just start messing around with it and be like, okay, what, what do I need to keep? Which of these ideas seem reasonable? I try them out on people. Um, which ideas do I need to let burn off? Because it's like, oh, nice thought, but that's just too kooky. That doesn't make sense. Get it out of here. So in regards to coming back and playing, the next area I felt to try was consistent at bats with, with, with creatures trying to get you out who have been practicing their positions, you know what I mean, and want to eat you. Um, and so, well, I've been able to get a barley about 60 at bats, and in January, I was able to just kind of collect these um, in different in different places. And um, I would say coming to Long Island, if I were to perform, there is, and this is nothing against the Atlantic League, there, there are sand lots faster than that. And I would have no problems trying, like to try it out if I were able to, you know, be productive. And so that's how I've kind of approached it because like you mentioned, Jake, you mentioned success and I'm trying to be, I wouldn't say careful, but if I pick a game, if I play a game that I can win, if I pick a game that I can win and play that, those are good games to play. If that makes, you know what I mean? Uh And so I'm trying to, I'm still almost trying to formulate what success is so far. Success is to me would be, I I voluntarily want to show up each day because I'm curious about this. You know what I mean? That's bringing me to the ballpark, you know, um, trying these you know, getting to play, you know, go out there, express myself with your teammates for a common goal. And so that's kind of been the area of success, you know, each day that I want to do that and choose to do it. So well, that is, that makes sense. Absolutely. And that that's, I would say 95% of the battle is still wanting to do it, knowing, you know, the, the grind that you're going to have to go through. Uh, you know, I, I can tell you, I was in the Atlantic league last year and a uh, 13 hour bus ride um mm-hmm. day day one i'm like uh we had a 10 hour bus ride and i was like what time's the flight tomorrow and they're mm-hmm. like no there's no flight you're gonna get on a bus for 10 hours i go 10 hours and then what and they're like and you're gonna get there and you're gonna play the next day and it just started from there and me and fonzie i had edgar alfonso was the manager last year and i was the pitching mm-hmm. coach and we're every day was just like what's gonna happen today what is gonna happen today and with all respect like you said about um, the Atlantic League, there's professional guys, there's guys who play in the big leagues, and you'll, you'll have some teammates who have played, Ruben Tejada being one of them. Yeah, um, Ruby Tuesday. Yeah, oh, I love you, Ruby. The guy, like, oh, just as a quick aside, how good yeah. did he look in the WBC? Right? That guy doesn't look like he's aged, aged a day. No. Unbelievable. No, he's no, the I, best. It, yeah, so I was I was very pumped to see, you know, when Ruben was one of the first ones we signed back, and then, you know, it, it, it came out. Uh, I remember Wally called me. He goes, you're never going to guess who I talked to. I'm like, uh, I know they had been hunting down Harvey. And I go, Matt? He goes, no, better. I go, better? What's better? He goes, he's coming back to be a hitter. I'm like, who is? He's like, Murph. I'm like, get out. No way. He's like, yes. He goes, figured out something in the swing, and he wants to try it out. And there's no way I was going to say no to that. He goes, I want him in the lineup. And I'm, yeah. and you're one, of, you're one of those guys. Listen. Like you said, for better or for worse, and I got to sit there, you know, in the, in the, in the analyst chair and, and watch you play and be able to. And I always told you guys that I would never say anything about you that I wouldn't say to your face. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like, that's one of the things as a as a former player. There's that trust and there's that respect factor. And when you talk about the whole, you know, the fielding wasn't the best. And sometimes you thought you were invisible on the base paths trying to take the extra base. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. that, always, that always happens, but that's not because of lack of trying or lack of hustle. That's something I always respected about your game is that you showed up and you showed up to play and you gave it your all. Well, my my that. one my one question, of course, is, I mean, you know, the media can be very cruel. And there was that comment about you being a net negative uh, about towards the end of your Met career, because I was one of the first people that got on. on uh, I would say I was on air and I said, let me get this right. We have Daniel Murphy, who for all intents and purposes, has found a home run stroke to go with a guy who can hit 300 swing and he can play a multitude of positions for you. You got Lucas Duda, who's got a bad back. You got uh, David Wright, who's got a bad back on the corners. Murph can fill in and Mm -hmm. you guys can rotate. Now I'm I'm saying this on the air and I sat back and they were like, well, how much would it take to keep him? And I said, 
and I started looking at the second baseman in the league and saying how much each guy made. And I said, well, listen to this one. You can't tell me that Oliver Perez as a pitcher getting 12 million a year to pitch. And you saw what happened with that, with walking everyone and everything else. I go Murphy services for 12 million a year, 36 million would be a, a, something that you couldn't do easily and say he's worth all of that. And then some because of all the different things he can do. The Ben Zobrist approach, right? Being able mm-hmm. to play different positions and be mm-hmm. an asset no matter what. Um, that to me is where like when I talk about the media and that whole ne- net negative, was that a motivating factor when you left the Mets and went on to almost have an MVP year there with the Nationals the next one? Well, I would say first off that that Gary actually, he specifically came to Vieira the next spring training and we had a fantastic conversation, um, Cohen, um, which was awesome. And then as far as a motivation, one of the things that that I feel like was to my detriment and benefit was I was able to put blinders on and just kind of focus at the task at hand. Now, I better pick a proper task to focus on because I would block a lot of things out. So I didn't, that really didn't come across, I would say, even my, my, my view of where I was. You know what I mean? I think I may have heard it kind of in passing. Right. But at that point, after playing the postseason games and what it physically and mentally and emotionally took out of me, um, and I would say us, it was like, you know what right. I mean? And it's like, you know, and, and, and again, like, well, the beauty of the West here in America is like, what, if you got something to say, you get to say it, you know what I mean? And so I get to go out there and just choose what I want, I want to focus on. And so, you know, with that, and then the next year, you know, swung it well against the Mets. That was probably just Kevin Long and Pat Rossler, you know, I would say giving me permission to try to take chances to the pool side, which Mm is draws to the pool side. Mm-hmm. in my experience in my career is where I'm the most productive. Okay. I'll maybe explain it that way. And so K long and Pat kind of sat me down and said, well, you have good barrel accuracy. You don't seem to swing and miss much. Okay. Are you getting good balls to hit? And where are you trying to use your accuracy? It's kind of the conversation we had. And it basically gave me the freedom to try to hit one in the bullpen with the draw. And I was like, right. well, that sounds like great fun. I will try it. And I, I was fortunate to have some success early. So I would say the game that um Jordan Zimmerman, when we play the Nationals, which is about, my goodness, golly, that place was rocking. Like City was just rocking. Um, Grandy gets gets some um, gets Zim on a breaking ball. I think yeah. I get the I get the next pitch, and then Duda hits the two run shot, and the place is like it's yeah. the place is coming down. I lost that my was, voice that night. I was in the crowd. I, I lost my yeah. Voice that game. Well, we all did, and then. This is when I, I, I had a feeling that, that we were on to something with the ball club is that we went down to Miami the next day. Um, I'll kind of jump ahead and then come back. We went down to Miami to play the next series. And that place, will like that will low, they'll lull you to sleep. And mm-hmm. those guys get paid too, and they have motivation, and they find reasons to come out and want to, like, you know, you know, knock your teeth in. And we went down there and got two out of three. And Michael Conforto cracked two homers, I think, and, like, kind of took the series over a bit. And we got a really good series win coming off that high because – Conforto, those young guys bring energy. Golly, they would bring energy late. Um, and so I would say that when Kevin and Pat allowed me the freedom to kind of hit the draw to the pool side, you know, take mm-hmm. the shortcut and really mm-hmm. try to just turn it loose. What I was fortunate to have a bit of success with that early. And then, you know, through August, September of the postseason, and then it was able to just kind of carry that into DC. Um, and I, I had a really good opening day, too, against Tehran, Julio, with Atlanta, which kind of let me settle in to being in, like, a new uniform. And mm-hmm. if you're thinking, which I was, how much of that – because it's, like, the postseason is, like, that's not real. Right. But how much of it do I get to carry with me? You know what I mean? Because mm-hmm. was fortunate to do some of it, but that's, that's, that's not real. But I get to try to keep some of it. And to have a good game that first opening day, and we played well in that series um, – just kind of let me settle in. And I was also able to fly under the radar there. It was like Bryce and um, Rendon. And, you know, I would just, I'd lie in the weeds on him. You know what I mean? <laughs> Hit in the five hole. Do you ever regret not coming back to the Mets and finishing the job that next year? They offered you one year, 15.8. You would have got more for the one year uh, per year. 
uh, there, but only one year versus three. Do you ever regret not returning? Well, yes, I would say I would have to say yes, without a doubt. Um, and it, it, it goes to. I did it. So when you asked the question, I thought it this way. Um, I came up with Yuri's Familia and Juan Lagarth and Tejada, um, and I learned at the feet of David Wright. And so, like, these guys are family to me. And, you know, mm -hmm. um, I, I still I still reach out uh, to, to Jacob, you know, to Grom, who, whom I love. And so I would say those are the type of regrets um, that, I, that I would say I experienced because, like, well, I, I wore the orange and blue you got hanging in the back there more than any of the other ones I wore. So it's not like it's in the bloodstream. And I was fortunate enough to cut my teeth coming up through the minor league system as well, too. So, you know, it's in there. Yeah, yeah. I would I would have liked to see him be a lifelong man. I would have liked to see you be here for, you know, you're one of my favorite players. I always remember uh, I was in the Atlanta team hotel 2008 uh, with my parents. And I run into the Nelson Figueroa when he was on the Mets there. And I said, oh, mom, he's from Brooklyn. You should go say something. They went to the same high school, saw him get in the elevator. I run into I think it was your cousins and your dad going up to our room and they saw, Oh, you're a big yeah. Mets fan. We're I'm, I'm Daniel's dad. I'm like, Oh wow. Like I love, I love him. Like, and we end up giving him a ball. He brought a ball for you to sign. Your dad brings it up at like 11 PM midnight. My mom's in a robe, opens the door to your dad with the signed ball from you. Uh, so I remember that, but I don't remember what I had for lunch today. It's pretty crazy. Yeah, well, but, uh, the old man, if he tries to tell you, he's going to do something. He likes to follow through. I hope I could, uh, I aspire to do that myself. Yeah, no, it was, it was fun. And uh, I, that's why I asked, because, you know, I think it would have been interesting. 2016, you know, the Mets could have used one more run in that wild card game. We were right there on the edge. One more run and maybe another Daniel Murphy October dinger could have uh, put us over the top. Yeah. No, it was um those battles that year in 16 with the Mets were they were well, coming in the visiting clubhouse was just unique you know, mm -hmm. and different. And so, um, yeah, the, the fans were so warm and welcoming the first one back and then they booed me the rest of the time is, <laughs> well, how about this? They, they did um, their job in trying to elevate their team as best they could, which was like, well, you booed the guys in the other uniforms, you know what I mean? In the, in the native clothing. In the, and you had to have a chip clothing. on your shoulder going up against them. I mean, you must have wanted to go four for four every time you played the Mets that year. Well, uh, the, some reporters would ask that. They'd say it's, it's always good to play well against a division opponent. Nah, there you go. That's the smart answer, right? It's so always talking, nice to play well against a division opponent. Listen, you you were talking about, you know, those teammates that you had on the way up. And, of course, when you get to the big leagues, you have somebody like David Wright there. Um, you know, I, I have one story in mind about David Wright early on in your career, and I'm pretty accurate with it. Spring training. Uh, oh, man, yeah. <laughs> You, know, you yeah. want to tell, I'll let you tell the story. That's all you had to Go say. Up, spring training, stomp man. on it. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't even think I fired the first shot. I would have been too scared because like to go and battle with David, if you fire a shot at David, you you have to be fully prepared to go to places that, that you just didn't <laughs> think you'd have to go. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. It's like you, you, you do something to David and he'd, he'd put your car on blocks or something like that. And mm -hmm. It's not, it's not that it's not funny, David. It's just, I got to get home. You know what I mean? I got to get to the hotel and get ready for the game tomorrow. And uh, so, no, I had a, my first spring training, uh, I had a Honda Civic that I had purchased with some of my signing bonus, half of my signing bonus. And so, you know, well, when you got to get somewhere, that was my car. So I would bring it into camp every day down there, drove it down to St. Lucie from Jacksonville, got all my stuff in there. And David and Frenchie, Frank Court, got my keys somehow. So I'm not on the menu that day. I think I'm I'm not playing. And so all of a sudden, you know, they say, we're raffling off this Honda Civic Blue. And I looked down and I was like, that son of a – looks like my car. Like, it looks a lot like my car. It couldn't be my car, but it looks a lot like it. Well, it's mine. You know what I mean? And it's just getting paraded around – uh <laughs> what the the warning track out there is they say they're <laughs> going to auction off my vehicle so um yeah needless to say that was um that was david and frenchy letting me know that that well it's honda civic sir if you've been you just don't bring the honda civic down to camp and so i end up going to buy a ford edge i think that was my next that was my upgrade 
<laughs> so that's one of the beautiful things, right? We talk about hazing and stuff and good natured mm -hmm. fun. You see, when you get to the big leagues, guys take it to another level. Like he said, they would legitimately, if you had rims on your car and you bragged about your rims, oh yeah, well, what happens if you don't have your rims at all on the car? And they take your wheels off and leave it on blocks. It happened many a time to many a rookie who came in with the, you know, oh, big signing bonus. And you had a veteran guy there who's played for 20 years and has made half as much money. They're going to make sure that you uh, humble yourself just a little bit. It, it's just yeah. part of the, the rites of passage. Well, we had a, um, a Brad Andrus. So that that year in spring training, he used to he split us up into lines, and that was my that was that was oh nine was my first big league camp. So in two thousand eight, I was in minor league camp. Two thousand nine was my first big league camp, and um, he split us up, and he had first like minor league guys in minor league, and the minor leagues who are in big league camp who have been invited over. And then all the way to 10 plus years of major league service. And he said, young guys and the lines all the way there, watch the big books because they've learned how to navigate the forest. And I remember thinking like, what the hell is he talking about? But well, when you go into the forest, there are things trying to eat you. <laughs> and all those guys down there with 10 plus years of major league service have learned how to be hunted and hunt. So mm -hmm. watch how they move yeah. because they move well enough to not get eaten <laughs> yeah you don't have to be the fastest in the forest you just have to be faster than the guy next to you yeah i mean it's it's such a it's such a beautiful game like it's it just it's what is it the 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 defense is the only game only where the defense has the ball so yeah. you like you get to attack in mm -hmm. some manner of speaking on defense like that's i love it and then but I like the hitting because I get to decide last. And I love that part. I like to gather as much information as possible. And then you try to dance with your dance partner out there. And you try to bring him as close as you can. Because, well, when Tyson dropped that uppercut on somebody, it almost like he would whisper in their ear before they shoveled him off next. You know what I mean? So you got to bring your dance partner in close. But the only way to do that is you've got to be in control of your own movements. And so it's I'm a big fan. Big fan. The six straight games with the homer that's still a record in the postseason. Did you have like a superstition that morning? Did you have a certain flavor of Gatorade? Did you keep doing the same thing? That run, mm. it just doesn't happen. So there had to been something you were doing those days or some superstition mm. that was working. Or like you wore the What's same sock yeah. every day. I don't know. I got into a routine, honestly. And this is – um. Like I was reading a lot of proverbs because my anxiety levels were through the roof. I wanted to throw up every game, like leading up to it. Like I was sick. Um, I remember Clippard was next to me before game five. It's the Dodgers. And I had read my proverbs earlier, but they weren't settling on my stomach properly, apparently. And he's like, hey, man, uh, are you OK? You look like you're going to throw up. And I was like, well, I'd like to, but we have a ball game and forward is the only way to go kind of and so <laughs> yeah I would say that it just that postseason was 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 a lot of fear and anxiety but each time each one of us kind of together were able to conquer whatever that task was in front of us we were now the the individuals who had done that and we were able to take those experiences forward and so we just kind of started just building on ourselves pitching so well um and then and I, I do think it's, it's probably especially against the Cubs, the the early home runs with how well they were throwing the ball. So like to be able to strike early and then give our give our pitchers a chance to go on defense. You know what I mean? Yeah, it, Degrom doesn't look like he's on defense, and Not Matt really. or Matts or Syndergaard, none of them did. But so I would say of like perhaps of those ones, maybe the cup, the timing of the ones in game one and two. You know what I mean? To kind of spike when David has the great at bat in game two um, to score Grandy, hits the double, um, and then I kind of jump on him, and it's like 3 nothing, right out of nowhere on top of winning game one. And so, um, yeah, let's see. I don't know if that answered your question. Well, I guess the nerves, maybe nerves, that was interesting. So you felt like you were going to throw up. I guess it felt that way in the World Series. Like you didn't put up the same numbers in the World Series. Did the nerves get worse in the World Series? I mean, the Royals pitching was pretty damn good. That was a good team, too. I wouldn't say it got worse. I just got, I just got eaten. Um, <laughs> yeah, I just, I just wasn't. Yeah, I just wasn't. Um, so what is it? I wasn't as confident. And I remember that that first game, 
I would say maybe I maybe I try to think of it foundation like first principles. The Royals as a team in comparison, I only speak for myself, were more prepared for what was going to transpire in that series than I was. Uh And so by the time I came to, the deed had been done and I had not played very well. I don't yeah, know it makes, that, to- yeah, no, it makes total sense, sense because remember yeah. they had just been to the World Series yep. the year before. Yep, and I so- did. I heard something too because sorry to interrupt you. They mm-hmm. had gone Game Seven, lost because Madison Bumgarner had thrown the ball so well and yep. won it. And I remember someone told me that the next year, I forget who it was they were. Uh, might have been Butera, but I think Hosmer came in the first day of spring training and had shirts to some effect like, "We're here to do one thing, and that's to be the team that wins the Game Seven. And I remember thinking. That's a choice right there. Right. And um, yeah, they just, I, I would say that's probably how I would describe it. Like I just, I was, I was late to the punch and got punched. Now, and that's the battle you talked about, right? Toe to toe and how you counter and you're able to go on the offense or the defense. You have to make those decisions. That Royals team being as prepared as they were and that, that really what the, you couldn't even name three of the starters, uh, but that bullpen was just lights out. That bullpen was just, you knew you got to the sixth inning, you were facing plus plus arms with nasty stuff. And yeah, Madsen came back. I played with yep. doggy Madsen had come back that year, Herrera. And then they turned it over to Wade mm-hmm. because Greg Holland had gotten banged up earlier that year, if I'm yes. not mistaken. So he wasn't, he wasn't pitched. Yeah, they were, they threw the ball. And then even, uh, and I say even, See why Chris Young went and grabbed like maybe nine outs in the mm-hmm. extra inning game in the yes. um in the first one and he threw the ball well. Yeah. They were um they were so I know that like to talk for the defense, they did a good job of putting the ball in play. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Really That's good contact, did. you know, make the defense touch the ball. And well, I did I didn't touch it super properly in that series. But I thought <laughs> they did a they did because I've been kind of watching it, it, it seems like in the postseason, like that the contact is because the games are shorter and they're, you know, the, all the intensity that just the contact is a much bigger deal in the postseason. You know what I mean? Because you mm-hmm. don't have the, the the course of the entire season to let the power if it comes with a bit of a you know swing and miss with it. And so, yeah, when you you make the defense touch the baseball and, you know, high leverage situations, well, they got to touch the baseball when their heart rates spike through the roof. Yeah, I remember they talked about making Lucas Duda handle the ball, and that was that ninth inning. I remember Familia comes in, and he <sighs> went his job of getting the ground still ball. A nightmare, still gets, a nightmare. Gets the ground ball to Damn. David Wright, and it was just wait for let Duda handle the ball. And they throw it across. Duda gets to try and throw home, and he makes the bad throw. Um, that That's just something. Ah, that, mistake man, was made long before that. Oh, no, without a I doubt. kicked that ball. No, no, no. But that, listen, I, People for years would always say, oh, Familia blew it, Familia blew it. And I was like, actually, he didn't blow it. He, he pitched to what he is. He's a ground ball pitcher. And mm-hmm. you have to handle the ball. So you have that confidence that your defense is going to make those plays. Without you hitting all the home runs, they never, probably never get there anyway. So there's a lot of stuff that is give and take. And I love the way that you speak in terms of we did it. And we you know, were the best team that year. Or, or you know, the success that you had is because of we and what we did mm-hmm. earlier in the game. And that that's something that... That I think you know, being a former teammate of yours, you know, it's you're we're interviewing you, and yet the whole time you're deferring to other people, you know, giving Kevin Long and Roster the, the credit for the success. There's a lot of that that I think people who don't know you or didn't really get to know you during this interview, there's a humility to you uh that is like nothing else. Some people felt that oh, he's too prideful, that's why he won't come back. Is no, there's a lot, there's a layer, there's layers to Daniel Murphy that I'm glad that came up throughout this interview. And, and it makes me so excited to hear you talk about baseball with the passion that you do. And my, so my big regret right now is, man, I want to stay on as the pitching coach so I can watch this guy every day mm-hmm. and see where you're at these days. But I will definitely be out at the ball games and I'm going to try and be a part of spring training. So I can at least throw you some BP and see how deep you can take yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, you. I'm gonna send you back to the mound. I don't. Can you do it? You ever? Well, so I've been watching the old, sorry, the old home run derby matchups. Mm-hmm. We'll watch Mickey Mantle and Willie Mays go at it, and they're throwing that sucker from the mound. That's right, where right, I used to take feet. BP from yeah. the mound. Yeah, man, got the the guy behind the plate, Art. I forget his name, but he he run Mickey. He run um, Willie Mays up on one. I couldn't believe it. You know what I mean? Called strike. Those things are awesome. Those have been fun to watch. Yeah, it's going to be a good time, man. I'm uh, I'm excited for uh, you do, taking advantage of this and I uh, wish you nothing but the best. I'm going to have that. I appreciate on loop. it. 
I'm gonna have you hitting homers off Figgy on loop. Please make sure there's a video camera there. Make sure you know I'll I'll make a TikTok out of it or something. But I'm uh, trying to I give did. up home runs. Don't you understand? Well, I'm throwing batting practice. Yeah. I'm trying. I, know, I just want to see. It. I want to see you get rocked. It's it's a great thrill for me as your co-host. It's, it's a nice. I've been considering playing around with that. I almost had my buddy. I had my buddy throwing me some batting practice the other day, and I almost pushed him all the way back to the mound because that's that's the. I mean. I mean, they, that's the way they took BP at the turn of the century. Like when I go back and watch Lou Gehrig and Babe Ruth, those guys are taking batting practice with a guy who's throwing the ball from the mount. Very interesting. Nice. Listen, there's important people watching. If you get in a groove, you know, the Mets you could use a bat. I could see you back in the big leagues this year. You know, fans, they have the number 28 ready. I don't. I think the Mets might have 28 available. I don't know if we have a number 28 right now off the top of my head. Um, so you get the number back in. You're back in New York. Have you talked with Wally about, are you just going to be a DH or are you going to play some second base or what? No, I mean, uh, people weren't overly excited to watch me play defense when they thought I could hit. Now that they're pretty sure that I can't. Um, but I did tell Wally, that's a bit. Of, I told him, run me out at third base, second base, and first base. Those are the places I have experience. Um, I don't I don't. I don't want to see myself in the outfield because I don't think that would be good. But we have the the spring training. And I was kind of like, if you like what you see, I've been taking ground balls and throwing. I'm like, if you like what you see, run me out there. If you don't, no hard feelings. Like, this is a meritocracy. Like, you, we got baseball games to win. And, you know, run me out there as you see fit. Um, you know, I'm definitely not opposed to defending. I I want to get – you got to catch this thing. You know what I mean? So, we'll see. Yeah, well, we're looking forward to it. have the Pedialyte ready for the mornings after with Wally. You might have some long nights ahead uh, out in East Islip. I don't know what the local pub is in East Islip, but uh, there could be some some good ones. Uh, and hope you report back to us with some of your party memories with Wally back. Oh, Wally's a treat. I loved having him as a bench coach. And, um, like, he's a – Wally's a proper sandlotter by my book. You know what I mean? Like, uh, he's, a, he's a baseball man right there. A dozen years in the big league, seven with the Mets. He was an all-star. He was an NLCS MVP, and now he's going to the Long Island Ducks at just a couple hours away. We're looking forward to seeing you, Daniel Murphy. And thanks for coming on Amazing But True with us. Cheers. Thank you, Jake. No, Figgy, I appreciate it. Thank you, guys. You got it, brother. Thank you.